Ab FM, Star FM, Simply the Best. We're also live on Ultimate FM in Kumasi and Empire FM in Takrade. And we are also streaming on the Facebook pages of GH1 TV and Star FM. So you better log on and watch this interview because tonight promises to be another great Wednesday night. I keep telling you that you're better off spending your Wednesday evening with me. The show is in association with Star Assurance, your solid partner, and Vodafone business Vodafone together we can and before we get into the actual conversation for tonight let me ask you this very simple question let me ask you this very uh, simple question um, if there is a fire outbreak right now in your workplace right now what will you do grab your fire extinguisher which you haven't likely used before or can't even operate or will you call fire service but that may even take a while they will take about 10 minutes or more to get to your location because they need to go to through all of these lungu lungu areas to get to you well tonight i'm assuring you that if you have the star fire and allied perils policy then you will worry less because star assurance will sort you out in no time at all so get the star fire and light allied policy uh, today, sign up for it today because behind every successful business is a Star Assurance policy. Star Assurance, your solid partner. Also, APSA Bank wants you to own your dream home. They're saying that the, the time of renting is over. Get up to 90% of the cost of your dream home from an APSA mortgage and pay in 20 years at a competitive interest rate. Make paying your rent a thing of the past. Be your own landlord. Enjoy the life that you so deserve with an APSA mortgage. Get APSA mortgage today. That's Africanacity. That's APSA. Visit APSA.com.gh for more information. It's still the big price drop at Puma Energy. Affordable quality is what drives unrivaled service at Puma Energy, which is why they continue to drive the performance that fuels your ambition. They're always happy to lend a hand for the amazing quality that comes with Ghana's most preferred oil marketing company. Head to any of the eight four branches nationwide and fill up with Puma Energy. Get your petrol or diesel at the retail station wide, uh, the retail stations uh, station nationwide. Uh, you can visit Puma Energy at Adenta, Medina, Hacho, East Legon, Spintex, Lashibi, Ashaiman, Dowenya, Sowutsuom, Fise, Kaswa, Kumasi, Sunyai, Takradi, Tamale. Puma Energy energizing communities. Every Wednesday evening, we bring you our business tip. Tonight's business tip is rather simple. Keep detailed records because all successful businesses keep detailed records. This business tip is brought to you by Vodafone Business Together we can with Vodafone. Vodafone says that no two businesses are the same. From phone calls between colleagues to the team WhatsApp group to bulk SMS to clients, every business has different needs. That's why Vodafone Too Much Business is offering the best mobile plan on the market with awesome value for amazing results. Design your mobile plans to talk, text, or more according to your unique business model because Vodafone Too Much uh, gives you the flexibility to customize your voice, SMS, and data plan to fit your business and your budget. Now you can grow your business to match your ambitions with more in your mobile package at the same price. To sign up, SMS START, that's S T E R T, to 0507 or email vodafonebusiness.gh at vodafone.com. Vodafone, together we can. We'll take our first break now. When we come back, I'll tell you about my guest tonight. The show is live on Ultimate FM in Kumasi and Empire in Takrade.
Kumasi on 106.9 and Empire 102.7 FM in Second D. Takrade. Now let's get straight into business. So, you know, I always like to start my show with a quote. Success, success is no accident. It is hard work, perseverance, learning, studying, sacrifice, and most of all, love of what you're doing or learning to do. This is a quote from the legendary Pele. My guest tonight graced our television screens with the results of pain and excitement long before the advent of social media and the internet. He defined sports on Monday nights from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. He's recognized and loved by the young and old, home and abroad, with his exceptional commentary and gracing the coverage of the first World Cup in Africa in 2010 in South Africa. His command of the Queen's language, both in speech and writing, makes him the toast of the many people in this country and the gold standard for Ghanaian broadcasters and sports journalists. In fact, his knack for speaking with clarity and verve always leaves me spellbound. Longevity has also come with its unique expectations of him, with some going as far as courting the idea of him becoming Ghana's sports minister at some point. So, what makes him love, reinvent, and evolve in the broadcasting space? Who is he when the cameras go off? Where did this passion-filled life begin, and when did it come in? Does he see himself living another life beyond this career with an eye for a higher leadership position? After speaking and writing about sports for decades, has he seen any considerable development in Ghana sports? Is Ghana a true football nation? Or are we just high on the euphoria of the lovely game but not smitten enough to make our love count with meaningful investment? Have we been cursed since we last won the AFCON in 1982? And are we getting our national team management right? The passionate Tuesday man, born in Apam, to a medical doctor and businesswoman, with eyes firmly fixed on a ball chased by 11 men and 11 women at every point in time, Kwabena Yebwa, a.k.a. the writer, is my guest on the award-winning sports personality chat show, <laughs> Star Chat. You are welcome to the show. Nana, thanks so much. Uh, <laughs> I'm humbled. <laughs> <laughs> Did I miss anything? <laughs> <laughs> wow, I'm humbled. I'm, uh, if you look, if I look carefully, you'd have seen me blush. <laughs> <laughs> Before we start our conversation, I want you to grade my attempt at celebrating a goal the way you know how. So, <clears throat> I need to clear my throat for this one. <laughs> How did I do with that? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Anyways, great to have you on the show. I really thank yeah. you for the privilege. I've been, I've been nursing or nurturing the idea of interviewing you for so long, and I'm so honored to have you in front of me. I feel privileged to be interviewed by a wonderful personality like you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, our, our path crossed several, several years Absolutely. ago. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I think the respect is mutual, and uh, I'm privileged to be here. Thank you so much for honoring our invitation. Okay, so let's get, I want to start off, of course, with something you truly love, football. Yeah, yeah. You've been running commentary for how long? Well, the first time I uh, did some commentary was in 1982. Oh, wow. Uh, that was when Ghana won Afghan, the last time we <laughs> won right, Afghan. That's right, uh, in, in Semasi, uh, Togo. Okay. Um, Eric Beck, who was then the main commentator, uh, so kind of were playing Semasi in the Africa Championship okay. uh, in Togo, and uh, I was privileged to be there. Okay. So uh, during recess, I was the main summarizer. That was the first time right. uh, I really did something like that. But around 1985, 86, uh, I went to Liberia during the Supreme Council for Sports in Africa okay. Zone Three tournament, and um, you know at the time Liberia didn't have a commentator. Their main commentator, they had one commentator mm. called Herbert Grigsby. Okay. Uh, who was you still main, remember his name? They have a great <laughs> <laughs> an amazing commentator. Yeah. Uh, but the others were mainly uh, radio DJs uh, who had been, had been drafted in uh, to run commentary. So they didn't understand the technicalities mm -hmm. of the game. Uh, and because it was a tournament, uh, they really didn't understand uh, the permutation as mm -hmm. to whether if a team scored one goal and considered two, what it meant. Right. So I had to explain all that. And then suddenly the whole of Liberia, uh, they started looking for me. And I remember a Christian station called Elwa uh, right. came drafting me uh, to go and work for them. So that was a, 
first time had real commentary. And then a year later, in Senegal, um, Niani Thompson was supposed to go and run commentary. He was late. Ghana were playing Senegal. And I was there with my very good friend, uh, Felix Abayate. So we were in the dressing room uh, picking up the lineup. Uh, you know those days, if you had to run commentary, you know, mm -hmm. they had to book the lines through Ghana uh, uh, PNT. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. then as soon as it was through, you, your attention was drawn to the fact that you had to go and run commentary. So when the lines were clear, Niani Thompson uh, was nowhere to be found. He was late to uh, the match uh, because right. I think he missed the date. So when the dressing room won, we were called to uh, go and run the commentary. Atuostin was then the minister for, then called secretary for youth in sports. So we had to run across the field uh, to go and run commentary uh, at that time. So basically, uh, from 82, uh, I've been doing this thing, running commentary all this while. So you used to go to Liberia a lot? For the for for tournaments, for tournaments, uh, yeah. For Supreme Council for so sports. So you, you knew you knew the you knew Monrovia quite well then. A lot because a lot. at the time you know they had. It's interesting. The pre, the head of state at the time, Do, mm -hmm. loved football so much that he naturalized three Brazilians to play for the national team. Interesting. Nascimento, Sergio, were all in the team. I'm from Brazil, and I used to visit them. Uh, at their hotel called Duco Hotel. Right. Uh, I was a regular there. So they built the stadium, new stadium, and then uh, there was a hostel attached to the stadium. And Do loved football so much that on my days, he was the one, the head of state, was the one driving some of the buses, the players. I remember what? very well. Yeah, Salinsa and uh, James, uh, James Deba, Salinsa and George Ria were the topmost stars. Right. And I remember in that tournament, uh, we played them in the final. And I mean, every attempt was made to win the match. <laughs> and I remember very well, uh, they tried bribing some of our players. Wow. Uh, Opokuti was the captain of the team, and it, they attempted bribing him through me. It was something I was never going to do. Uh, so our coach at the time, E.K. Dusay, we had to report the matter to him because our fear was that once we rejected uh, that bribery attempt, it was $5,000. Once we rejected it... At the time, that was time, huge. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they could exploit the other players, uh, so um, those players were quite vulnerable mm -hmm. and maybe uh, greedy. So we had to report to Coach Idisei, who then tightened security in camp at the time. And wow. uh, in the final game, I won by two goals alone. I was running commentary with them. And I remember Herbert Grigsby and the two other commentators. Mm -hmm. When Ghana scored the second goal, those two commentators started crying. <laughs> and uh, I mean, they so broke down fun. in commentary box, and I remember Herbert Griggs were telling them, don't cry, don't cry. <laughs> we pray to God to get us to the final. Now we're in the final. I mean, it was incredible. Uh, I, I would always remember those days with fond memories. So was the captain mm -hmm. uh, of the team at the time. And I remember the likes of Safu Janfi, Ebo Smith, uh, Gambo, uh, Abumoro was the star in midfield. It was an incredible team. And, uh, right. Interesting. <laughs> so you, you must have been quite disturbed uh, at what happened to Liberia later. Absolutely incredible. You know, those days, a number of Ghanaians uh, who even wanted so-called greener pastures mm -hmm. had to go all the way to Liberia to seek the greener pastures. I mean, these were a group of people who were very, very happy with themselves. And um, what happened was horrible. And there's a reason, I think, that African nations should be very careful what they pray for. Um, no matter how your, your concerns about your political system, I do not think that taking arms is the way forward mm. uh, because what happened to Liberia, and they have struggled up to now, yeah. you know, trying to yeah. recover. Yeah. Uh, George is doing his very best, uh, but there are serious concerns out there. And I remember George, we are a very good friend of mine, mm. and I remember predicting to him that he was going to be the president of Liberia. Oh, you did? Several years ago when he stayed. Was it based on his popularity? You know, I tell you what, when Liberia were on their knees, George Weir was the fulcrum and the galvanizing point right. for Liberia. Right. And his love and attention. I remember, you remember Liberia, the national team, used Ghana as one of their, uh, their base. Yeah. And George Weir was, Weir was bankrolling the team. And, you know, quite a number of their players were scattered all over the world. George would buy all their tickets, they were assembling Ghana. And quite a number of the Liberians scattered across the African continent, particularly the West African continent, uh, sub-region. George would organize all of them to come to Ghana and would pay their efforts back to their respective bases. At that time, I didn't see any Liberian leaders. Everybody right. had gone into hiding. 
And I thought George was an incredible personality. Again, that mindset that right. if you're a footballer, you're not capable of ascending to the higher heights, mm -hmm. I thought was completely wrong. So I remember telling him at East Legon, I mean, where he stayed, yeah. uh, when I used to visit him regularly, that you will become the president of Liberia sooner or later. Right. And so I was very, very excited uh, when he became the president of the land. Uh, time has not permitted me to pay him visits, right. but I'm very, very proud of him. But as I indicated, uh, running a country is a completely different ball game. Mm -hmm. uh, debilitating problems, confronting you has not been that easy. And uh, I'm hoping that the sub-region, because of what Liberia went through, uh, would aid Liberia really get on their feet. But mm. the bottom line is that those nations who are constantly yearning for war because political leaders are unconvinced about results of elections and think that the way forward is to pick up arms, I think that uh, Liberia is an example for them to take a cue from. Absolutely. That's uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And you still remember the names way <laughs> back in 1982. I mean, how do you do that? <laughs> Well, fortunately for me, uh, because it's my passion, uh, I've, I've lived with them. Uh, mm -hmm. The first time, well, I started way back when I was only nine years mm -hmm. uh, with the Kwa Ustos uh, in, uh, in Koko. Oh, so you're a Kwa woman? Kwa woman. Okay. And uh, Kwa Ustos, when I was okay. nine years. Okay. And remember those days, the captain of the team called Motowe. Mm -hmm. And uh, anytime they were going to matches, you know, they, they trained up, I mean, they, they, they dressed up mm -hmm. at the Koman Secondary School, and they believed so much in Juju. And uh, so they would sometimes keep me in a room, light all manner of candles for me mm. to take care of. <laughs> 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 you know, so Kwao Stores later on mm -hmm. uh, joined Kwao Super Boma. There were two rival groups, so Kwao Stores oh, and Kwao Super Boma. Right, later okay. became Kwao United. Okay. You know, so my uncle was a footballer who played for Kwao Stores, later moved to Akutex. So I joined him uh, in Somalia Akutex, uh, spent some time there, and then he was later. He later moved to Asante Kotoko mm. around 1974-75. So I moved to join Asante Kotoko. And uh, I was one of the two ball boys in the camp of Asante Kotoko. Wow. Those were the days when we used to come at the University of Science and Technology. And those were the last days of Asay Kofi. I remember very mm. well. Malik Jabber, Yasam uh, were all in the team. And Godin Prempe, that was the last, those were the last years of Godin Prempe. Right. Seven players from Akutes who were sacked because they claimed that they had collected bribe from Hearts of Folk in the Nefe Cup. You know, a number of them joined um, Asante Kodoko. So the likes of Kankam, Jibrin, Ohin Basia himself, Justice Apia, Charles Ose, all joined Asante Kodoko. You know, so Kodoko 75, I joined them as a ball boy. And then I remember very well, Chen Chahini visited a team in camp, Adai Chen Chahini, if you know him very well. He later played for the Black Stars, a member of the winning team, 1978 winning team. And when he came to camp in 1975-76, he was wondering when he was ever going to be a regular member of the team. He had visited. He wasn't part of the right. team. And I remember as a small boy, I didn't know what came of me, but I told him that next year he was going to join us as a big star. <laughs> I didn't know what I was talking about. Yeah. And then the following year, Chen Chahini became a huge star. Mm -hmm. I remember Kodoko played against Hearts of Folk in Accra. You know those days, there weren't many newspapers. Mm -hmm. He was on the cover of the mirror. Chen Chahini storms Accra. And then he was drafted into the national team, senior national team. So Chen Chene picked me and took me to the senior national team, the Black Stars at men's room when the team camped. Mm. So again, I was a ball boy in camp uh, at men's room, 1977, uh, when the Black Stars were camping. And I remember the then head of state, Kutua Champon, uh, was very passionate about sports, particularly right. football. So he was a regular face that to come. And he asked them which nation, you know, near to play football. They said Brazil. So okay, good to come for Brazil. So we had the Novelty League in 1977. Uh, that is the National League without the national players okay. who've toured Brazil. So you, I mean, you had the likes of the national team in 77, uh, 78. It was one of our best squads. Uh, Joseph Carr was in the post. Have we had a squad Husseini, like that? Uh, 92 was that close. Okay. You know, uh, PSK Paha uh, on the right side with Haruna. Offense on the left side, Kuku, Dazi, uh, in, in central defense, an extraordinary player. Then Chen Chen and Adolf Farmer, two central midfielders, Yosing on the right side. I am walking. Uh, I mean, you remember? <laughs> <laughs> you remember all of that? I mean, the exact <laughs> <No>. <laughs> details. <laughs> now, Dan, Dan Kaidi, who was a senior brother of Ben Kaidi, <laughs> with Anna Seiru on the right side. Every, I mean, then Pukwa Free and George Alassan, I mean, central attack. And then he had the great. 
uh, Abdul Razak and Mohamed Polo. Wow. On the left side alone, we had about three uh, left wingers. Uh, Francis Kumi was there. Kuntu Blankson was there. Ajman Prempe was there. Unfortunately, Ajman Prempe got injured, so he couldn't make the final uh, squad. Absolutely incredible wow. squad. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> My goodness. I mean, you, you remember all of this so well. Wow. I mean, I'm just lost for words. That's... <laughs> That's amazing, and this is a while back. Well, the, the beautiful thing, uh, and I thank God for that. Mm -hmm. I have not read these things in the books. I live with them. And as a young boy, I loved what I was doing, and I remember very well. So you always knew you were going to end up I here? I, no, I didn't, didn't know. I no. didn't know. You were just passionate about it's football? It's called divine intervention, right? and I'll come to that. Okay. You know, during those days, 77, any time we went for training sessions as a small boy, I loved the place so much, and I thought after training sessions, they would be so thirsty. So in my little mind, I'll go and buy sugar cane once a week. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Can I give to the players? They all love me. And they call me Chen Chenin's brother because uh. Uh, I spent my, I mean, the night, I slept in the same room with Haruna, you see, who was on the right side of uh, defense with Chen Chenin. Okay. And Chen Chenin has been, been amazing to me. He loved me so much. So the players normally call me. Chen uh, Chen's brother. brother, and uh, we spent so much time in men's clothes. Is this is that where you um, developed your love for Kotoko? Because you you are an unapologetic Kotoko fan. Yeah, and, and I keep uh, making this point as I indicated to you because my uncle played uh, for Kotoko in nineteen from seventy five, mm. and he took me to come. I was a ball boy mm. of the team. Uh, I grew up loving Kotoko. Chen right. Chen showed me so much love, and then at a point, Opokunti came into the picture. Mm. So the days. From 1980, when Smith Mason took over Santi Kotoko and transformed the team, uh, I was part of that story. Uh, when they won the cup mm -hmm. in 83, uh, I was with them. So I've always been closely associated with Kotoko. With Santi Kotoko. And uh, 83 was another incredible squad. Yeah. You know, any time <laughs> that I had to watch you on uh, GTV, uh, Monday, 8 p.m., one of the things I look forward to was the way you pronounce Kotoko. Asante Kotoko. <laughs> I mean, that's why I learned to pronounce Kotoko. <laughs> it's the way you said it that made it so special. Uh, but even at the time, I still didn't fall in love with Kotoko. <laughs> I'm, 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 a, I'm a fan of Accra Great Olympics. Whoa, oh, yes. Daddy. Oh, need that day. Thank you very much. The greatest team in Ghana. Whoa. <laughs> what do you think is the problem with Asante Kotoko now? It's not now, and it started long ago. Okay. And uh, I've had issues with the management structure of the team. Mm. And let me say that in the past, uh, we didn't play professional football in Ghana. So it was more recreational, and mm. people just did it for the love of it. So I remember from 1977, um, 78, F.D. Nsian was in charge of the team. It was just recreational. Fortunately, uh, Kodoko had all the players because Ghana hadn't been hit by the Exodus bat, right. you know. So all the players were here. And then Kotoko were blessed to have a bank, I mean, I mean money back, who had a very, very deep pocket, uh, a businessman uh, who was bankrolling the team, um, BK Dusay. Mm. So they didn't have problems with money and were attracting all the best players in the country. And the reason as far back as 1970, they attracted Robert Mensah for 1,000 Ghana cities. Mm. And not you cities remember, those days, uh, you 1, remember 000, the, the one, exact figure. Absolutely, 1,000 cities with the VW. <laughs> you uh, know, that's so <laughs> interesting because I, I, I don't even remember how much we, how much Manchester United paid for <laughs> the year. <laughs> how many seasons ago, I don't even remember. You know, yeah. So they attracted all the best players. Yeah. Uh, Ibrahim Sunday from Cornerstone to mm -hmm. uh, Kumasiya Santi Kotoko. Every single top player in Ghana wanted to play for Kotoko because of what Bikinese was doing. Mm. But as I said, it was more recreational. Right. So when BK passed, may so rest in peace. Um, again, the Exodus, but hadn't really beaten hard. And then came from '77, as I indicated, everything just struggled a bit. Then Sims Mensah took over mm. and uh, brought in some money. At that time, from '75, '76, '77, I mean, Hearts of Oak had the fearsome fivesome. Uh, you're a great Olympics fan, but mm. the fearsome fivesome. <laughs> I've never seen an attacking machinery as trenchant as the uh, fearsome five -some. Since then? No, not at all. Why? With Robert Hammond, expensive Robert Hammond, Anat Seydou, Mohamed Polo, Bomba Mamakwa, and Peter Lamte, gold thief. Absolutely incredible. 
Adofama was in midfield. He was not one of the fearsome fivesome, but he was the second best midfielder in Africa. Wow. It tells you how solid the team was, you know. So they were always beating us on Tikodoko. Then Sims took over and, I mean, brought a number of players into the squad. So then came players like Opokunti, mm. uh, Zito, uh, all joined the team at the time, uh, Alberta Sassi from Voradep to strengthen the team. But as I said, all those periods, it was more recreational. All the Kodogu were chucking mm. success by success. The structures hadn't been built. So it was all based on the pockets of just one man. Right. But as the years rolled by, I mean, the demands on the club has become so intense. So I tell you what, most of the executive chairman of Asante Kodoko, mm. after the tenure, went broke. Wow. So His Excellency, Jay Kufo, the former president of the land, when he took over as the chairman of Asante Kodoko, decided because most of the uh, chairmen were getting broke, it was important to introduce what he called the concept of a CEO to ensure that at least people didn't get broke after exiting. So he engineered, and Kodoko brought in a, a, a gentleman called SK Awa from Gimpa okay. to become the first CEO of Asante Kodoko. Uh, uh, Jay Kufo uh, was the chairman of Kodoko, and I had mm. very close links with him. Almost all the trips of Asante Kodoko I did with him. I was right. always in his house. We had a great time. But as I indicated, times have changed. Let me fast forward. Okay. Times have changed. And the financial demands are so huge. And I think that what has really, really troubled Kodoko over the years is this concept of having a board, which is not necessarily bringing in so much money, and, and then a CEO. I personally th believe that they are better off having an executive chairman uh, who would appoint his uh, executives to run the team. But for me, that is not even the issue. Right. Kotoko needs a paradigm shift. They need a major shift from the way the cl club is run at the moment. Okay. If they want to compete with the likes of Ali, Esperanza, Tua de Sahel, and all the others, they need a strategic investor. And I've been saying this over the last 12 years. And I made the point that, look, over the last 12 years, Kotoko would win the league, if you beat Brikum Chelsea and you beat the Diana Stars to win the league, that's no achievement. That is not where Kodoko should be operating. Right. Kodoko should be operating with the likes of Ali, Esperance, Tipi Mazembe. We're from Tipi Mazembe. Yeah. Because Moe Katumba sank in so much money, they won the Africa Cup, they played in the Super Cup, and they played in the Club World Cup. But for me, it's a joke. What is happening right now is a joke. Kodoko will go nowhere. And I say this not because I want to be cynical mm -hmm. or skeptical. I'm not a prophet of doom. I wish the team all the best. But if there is no major shift, Kodoko will continue to mark time. They will continue to retrogress. And I take inspiration from what is happening in, in Europe, mainly, especially in England. Mm -hmm. When you talk about having a strategic investor, you are reminded of the fact that Kodoko is a traditional team and they cannot have uh, new owners. And I love about it. You are no more traditional than Liverpool. Absolutely. You are no more traditional than Manchester United. Mm -hmm. Okay? But I'm saying that at a point when it was obvious that they needed to invest so much in the club to compete, I mean, with the likes of Madrid and Barcelona, Juventus, on the uh, 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 European level, they had to get strategic investors. And the point I keep making is that the fact that you have an American investor is not going to change the colors of Manchester United. Mm -hmm. Manchester is still Manchester. Yeah. At the end of the day, Old Trafford is Old Trafford. It's still the red colors. Mm -hmm. When they win titles, yeah. the Glazers are not going to take the trophy away to the USA. Yeah. And I'm saying that Chelsea are Chelsea because Abramovich went and changed the dynamics. Mm -hmm. Again, if you check City, I mean, yeah. we're from City. Yeah. For 50 years, they had never won any laurels until the deep pockets invaded the territory and started purchasing players for all. Without money, how are you going to get Pep Guardiola yeah. to come start buying players? Look, the opening game of Chelsea, although they lost the game, their bench was 350 million pounds sterling. The bench, the players who were sitting on the bench. You know, so you need to invest. And I feel sorry. Kodoko have experimented over the years and is a reason... Because they're not getting it right, every now and then they're kicking out. A CEO. Uh, I mean, either CEOs or, or chairman or <laughs> coach. Yeah. And I'm saying that it doesn't matter how many coaches you ch you you change. You know, at the point, after about 20 years, Kodogo had, had sacked, I mean, employed and sacked over 35 coaches. What? And I keep reminding them that the problem of the club 
had nothing to do with the coaches. A coach is only a reflection of the quality of the materials on the field of play. Right. You know, so if your finances are, are wrong, there is no way you're going to get it right. For example, I remember traveling in Kodogo to Egypt, and one of our players, we went and played Zamalek. After the game, Zamalek negotiated our best player, Joe Ochi, and signed him there. Yeah. As you and I speak, you and I know that Kojopoku, in the middle of the season, was transferred to Algeria. Are you serious? Is that a serious club? Look, we cannot continue to live on past glories. It doesn't work that way. And it would never work until there is a major shift in the way the club is run in terms of the structure, in terms of the, of the ownership. And I'm saying that. Look, if I see the amount of money is being sunk in Kotoko, you're talking about millions of Ghana cities, it's not going to work. I'm talking about millions of dollars. dollars right. When Ali celebrated his centenary and invited Barcelona for a friendly game, mm. they paid Barcelona $3 million. Mm. $3 million. I mean, you have Ali whose players are kept for a period of minimum eight years, and they are buying the best players from the rest of Africa. And you are the same team going to compete with them. It does not work like that. It doesn't matter the emotions you in invest in a Santi Kotoko. We love Kotoko, but I'm saying that until there is that paradigm shift, we will continue to mark time. We will make no impact in Africa. It is so shameful Kotoko enters Africa and the fans around there are kicked out. Mm. We can't even play at the group stage, let alone talk about playing in the grand finale. When was the last time Kotoko got to the quarterfinals or semifinals of the Africa Cup? We're getting it wrong, and I'm saying that I'm surprised that we are not understanding why we're marking time all this while. And talking about Kodoko applies to all the other teams. Yeah, I was going to ask you if it's, a ref if, if it's the same issue with all the other it ref it, Ghanaian teams, it local teams. It reflects all the other teams. And I use Kodoko because, personally, I think that they have the biggest potential mm. uh, in terms they of... They just turned 86. 86. Yeah. In terms of the following, mm. they have massive following. Yeah. And their supporters, very loyal, very loving supporters, yeah. long suffering. It's painful to see as a as a as an Olympics fan <laughs> <laughs> to see all of that. <laughs> I mean, these are supporters who yeah. love their team yeah. and will do anything to ensure that the team hits the success road. Mm. And it, it's just unfortunate that they continue to mark time. And again, I stay in this studio, and I tell you what: if there isn't that paradigm shift where we've seen millions invested in the team. We're not even talking about building their own shit, and that's not what I'm looking at. You need to build a team first, and without it. And building a team and sustaining players over a period of five, six years, and uh, attracting materials from outside your own country needs a lot of money. For example, TB Mazembe. Uh, Mazembe. Mm. They attracted Zambian players who are already playing in Europe for underlect and paid them $50,000 a month. If you talk about Ali, there are players there who are earning $50,000, $60,000. And that is a way to keep your players. I mean, but our Kotoko teams... has some Brazilians. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I don't want to offend anybody. But, you know, if you really want to attract the best materials, you must pay very well. Mm. What we pay right now in Ghana, for me, in blunt language, these are slave wages for footballers. You cannot pay... A Kotoko player, you want to make a mark in Africa and consistently win matches for you, a thousand, two thousand Ghana cities. It's a joke. The least any Kotoko player deserves, especially the start, starting uh, players, mm. for a start, for me, is two thousand dollars. Because you have your players leaving to Benin, mm -hmm. to other parts of Africa, because they've been baited, cajoled, and lured by one thousand dollars a month. Because they're not receiving that kind of money here. Yeah. So they will definitely leave. If you want to compete, I'm saying that the starting base should be 2000 as you look to improving the amount. Until we start doing that, our players will continue to live in numbers, will continue to mark time. It doesn't matter who you bring as the CEO, we will continue to have failures. Okay. In, in all of this, with, with all the teams in Ghana, where do you fault the GFA? I, I don't... It's, it's difficult dragging the GFA into okay. this matter. Okay. Uh, I, I say this because uh, I know a lot of people will start talking about sponsorship. Mm. It's not been easy. Uh, for example, if you go to South Africa, I do know that our sponsorship packages are juicy and make so much sense. I sometimes mock what we call sponsorship <laughs> in Ghana. 
And I remember several, several years ago, I don't want to mention the company, but when they brought some drinks to uh, camp in Kumasi as a way of sponsorship with all the mileage, <laughs> out of protest, I refused to even take the drink. You know, so for example, Kotoko has a number of sponsors, maybe like 15, mm. and people are excited and talking about it. And you want to quantify how much all that translates into. Mm. It's, it, it doesn't make sense at all. But as I indicated, the GFA can play a role uh, in attracting sponsorship. For example, you know, in, um, in England, for instance, mm. they had their first division, second division years back, and then Sky B Sky, um, mm -hmm. Rupert Murdoch, decided to beat them by giving them money you know, to create the Premier League. So the first year, uh, 350 uh, million pounds sterling uh, was paid. And initially, there was a resistance from the clubs because for the first time, their matches were going to be played at odd hours on Monday, 6 p.m., right. on Tuesdays, Wednesdays. It was very strange to most of the supporters who decided to even boycott TV and go to the stadium in the numbers. Yeah. But over the years, all that change and television through the FA's encouragement and initiative brings so much money to the clubs, yeah. apart from their own initiative. So there's a way that uh, the FA can help in all this. But why is difficult blaming uh, the FA? in this instance, is that television stations in Ghana are not that strong right. uh, to be able to cover the kind of money that would cushion life for, for the clubs. And again, most of the businesses in Ghana are not that strong, uh, like businesses in yeah. Europe and elsewhere, yeah. you know, to dollar money. But I do not think that is the reason we should give up and throw our hands in despair. Mm. We should still push. It's most unfortunate that at this stage, we don't have major sponsors for, 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 the, for, for our league. And I think it's an indictment on us. Uh, again, all of us viciously conspired to destroy the very brand that fits all of us over the period because one or two acts of malfeasance will be blown out of proportion uh, to taint and destroy the brand. And the corporate world are very, very sensitive about where they send their money. So if you taint the brand, so badly. No corporate institution wants to identify with that. So we have to be careful how we, you know, talk about some of the ills right. of the sport. In every society, there'll be one or two ills. But it's important for us to try and manage it, not to destroy the very brand right. we all live on. Okay. Two things that I, I want to talk to you about, because you mentioned the first one, Juju. All right. Um, and so many times we've had yeah. to discuss <laughs> the budget for ways and means. All right in Ghana. Yeah. Would it ever go away? I'm sure you, you've known about this for so long yeah. and it keeps <laughs> coming up. It's, it's, it's a recurring factor. That's right. You know, I'm laughing. Uh, I've been heavily involved in Juju over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was young with teams, mm -hmm. uh, because I was young with infantile brain right. and I believe mm -hmm. this nonsense. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, as I indicated, mm -hmm. the stores those days would do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kotoko were doing it. I remember those days when Hearts had the fearsome five some. Mm -hmm. The morning camp, uh, I'm not revealing any secret, okay. but some of the water for cooking was even imported from the north. <laughs> 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 you know, and uh, we, would, we would come to Accra and be defeated by Hearts of Oak. And then we'll be told <laughs> that on our way, we crossed a certain river. <laughs> and that diluted the potency of the juju. So... You know, the next time around, we had to fly. <laughs> and then we were beating again. And then it was like, okay, when the players arrived in a crowd, some of them sold their ropes. So, you know, for the first time, I could have went and stayed in the ship in Tema. What? Again, we lost. So, I remember <laughs> Joe Sam. <laughs> you know, Joe Sam, uh, former 11 Wise and Kodoko star, a right. national player, an incredible player, came to my uncle and told him, my uncle was Kwekusia. He said, Kweku, I mean, they made you name me in that's where he gave up. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you, it's most unfortunate right. that clubs in Ghana continue to heavily rely on Juju. And I've heard some players emphasize that indeed Juju works in football. Mm. You know, I have absolutely no patience for people who talk about Juju in football, that he works. It is so stupid. It's only <laughs> a dead brain who would believe that Juju plays football. I mean, it is something that we should not countenance at all. And I'm sorry that if my words mm. are that strong, mm. because we must condemn it in all uncertain terms. Look, some charlatans just exploit the clubs mm -hmm. and just take monies from them and pretend 
football is played in the supernatural world, mm -hmm. and uh, you have to be preternatural to win some of the matches. It's absolute rubbish. Because for those who believe that Juju plays football, how many, I mean, African teams have won the Club World Cup? That's number one. <laughs> number two, how many African teams have won the World Cup? Football has grown so scientific that teams are spending huge sums of money investing in infrastructure, in their diet, paying players well, taking good care of them, and uh, buying the best materials. Is anybody going to suggest that City, for instance, is the most fearsome team in England because yeah. of Juju? It, it, it's so stupid. Yeah. And when Kotoko dominated uh, Ghana and won the Africa Cup, it had absolutely nothing to do with Juju. It was because I indicated. BK Dusey was the chairman, oh, no, no, was, was, was the bank ruler of the team, mm -hmm who was investing so much. So look at Kotoko. Yeah. Robert Mensah was the best goalkeeper in Africa. Dan Opong was the best right back in... He in even a, had a, a he, His name was in a song. Robert Mensah, absolutely. goalkeeper number one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Dan was the best right back in Africa. Right. Olivaka was the best left back in Africa. Brinya was there. And Odami in central defense. Ibrahim Sandi was the best midfielder in Africa. Osei Kofi himself. Yao Sam. Abukari. Malik Jaber. I mean, <laughs> I mean, my, my producers are odd. They are odd. <laughs> they are so this, odd. Yeah. This, this is the reason they were winning the Africa Cup. Right. Fast forward. In 83, when Sims took over, uh, no, in 1980, and bought all those players, and, um, and as Yao Oferibowa took over the team, he was fortunate because the team had already been built. So Ka was still there. Right. And Esapau was there. Together with uh, Kosiapia on the left mm. side, I mean Seram Padu, Chenchehini, Roxing in midfield, Papaku, Opokunti, and Kofi Badu and uh, 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 Afri Opoku Afri had left the scene, but they had a Bumens, and all these players. How are you going to talk about Juju in right. this one? It makes no sense, Nana. We should discourage this. I think it's so stupid. It's so backward. Mm -hmm. It's it, it's. It's, it's something that should be not be tolerated. And I'll tell you, in frank language, Juju plays no role in football. And that is far from suggesting that I don't believe in a spiritual world. Right. I'm a Christian, thank God. Mm -hmm. So once you're a Christian, it means that you believe in the spiritual world. Absolutely. So you believe there is a God and there is a Satan, because scripture mm -hmm. says we do not fight against flesh and blood, yeah. but against principalities. So there's a spiritual world. But in football, it plays no role, as in sports. Mm -hmm. Because if you check the Olympics, for instance, mm -hmm. I mean, you and I know the preparations that go through the Olympics. And the fact that for some time the Americans were dominating the sprints, is it Juju that we have the East Africans dominating the long distances? Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with Juju. It's about training, it's about being scientific. And this is something that we should discourage these crooked brains who are behind some of these clubs who continue to confuse them and take their monies to go and do ways and means. We should discourage that. <laughs> right. It means it, it has no place in our football. Right. Look, you train and you pray to your God, I, I believe that, yeah. and you go and play your football. But to think that some juju somewhere is going to aid you win a match, it's so backward and, and so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You also mentioned your closeness. Um, uh, to President Kofor, former President Kofor. I understand that he offered to make you a deputy sports minister and you declined. <laughs> now, I've, I've answered this question a few times. Mm. Uh, I, I keep saying that. I don't think that uh, you need to be a minister to play your role in, the, mm. in this country. Uh, people, for example, if you go to, to, to the US, let me mm. as an example, you have the president of the land with his face showing, but there's a massive think tank running the country. He's only the face yeah. of, of the show. So I believe that people can play different roles uh, in this country without necessarily picking ministerial appointments. And I do not think that our ministers necessarily are the most important people. <laughs> I guess part of the reason a lot of people want to go into that arena and go into politics is because uh, in Africa especially, I mean, many people do not trust politicians around the world. Mm -hmm. Especially in Africa, many people don't trust politicians because it's mind-boggling that personalities you knew a few years ago 
enter politics and within a space of two, three, four years become sometimes less than two. All right, become millionaires. <laughs> yeah. And so a lot of people think that if you're offered that position, why don't you go there and make some money? But it's not the way it works. Right. You know, I was just reading something uh, which said that uh, to be trusted is more important than to be loved. Right. For me, integrity is so key. And I do know the love uh, Kufu, I call him Papa, mm. you know, had for me. And uh, Malamisa, who was then his first sports minister. Right. Uh, yeah. And I was supposed to serve under him and uh, I politely declined. How and did he take it? Well, life moved on right. uh, politely, and uh, President Mills uh, also offered that position, but mm. again, I politely declined. You see, also, I'm sorry, but uh, politics is so toxic, and we must do something about it. Politics shouldn't be as toxic as we find it in this country. You know, um, it's just clash of ideas. Mm as to how best to run this country, and all in an attempt to serve the people. But most African leaders, what they do is not to serve the people. Mm. They come to fill their pockets <laughs> and their bellies, which is most unfortunate. And I guess it's the reason a lot of people want to get into politics, to see how much they can snatch away. Right. And it creates an air of mistrust and suspicion, which is not too good for us as a people. Mm. And I think, Politicians should do well to clean the act and to let the people believe that indeed they have come to serve and not to lord over them. And that politics, you know, in Africa, politics has become a shortcut to success. Absolutely. You know, so if you want to uh, be a millionaire, probably your best arena is not to go into the teaching profession or to go into journalism. Uh, you are better off getting into politics. That's why a few of our colleagues, you know, have attempted getting into politics. Yeah. Not necessarily because I think many people believe they have the wherewithal to serve the people or they are so determined to be the servants of the people. Mm. I guess it's more about how much they can snatch away, right. which is most unfortunate. And I think there must be checks and balances in the system and there should be deterrent. How come ordinary poor people, when they commit crime, rapidly uh, they are sentenced and given uh, tough uh, sentences? And in the political arena, we have some politicians who are snatching away funds and nothing happens to them. It's most unfortunate. Look, you cannot steal a goat out of hunger or uh, cassava and uh, be sent to some to go and serve long sentences. And uh, some of our leaders uh, snatch away so much money. The evidence is there, but right. there's no deterrent. Absolutely. There's no punishment. And uh, so people start acting with impunity, mm -hmm. which is most unfortunate. I don't think the right signals are being sent out there to the larger society, that indeed people get into politics to serve the people. And I'm very, very passionate about that. I think that we should get into office to serve the people because we believe we have the passion and the desire and have the ability and the capacity to serve the people. Is right. why we get into politics. Not because we want to go and steal the people's resources. Milk the yeah. state. <laughs> Milk the state. Yeah. Okay. I want to talk to you now about the current crop of players in the Black Stars. Yeah. Even before that because I, I, I've been told that you were such a huge fan of Tony Yeboah. That's right. Okay, so a very simple question: <laughs> If you had to rate them, yeah, <laughs> Abedi Pele, Tony Yeboah, Asamwa Jam. <laughs> Why do you want trouble for me? <laughs> <laughs> How do you rate these? Where, well, where do these three stand? Well, I, uh, for you, first of all, uh, when you bring in Pele. The maestro. And remember, I named him the maestro. Yes. I, 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 I was. Were well, you so awed by his skill? Now, listen, I've never seen in this country, apart from Mohamed Polo, I haven't seen any player like Abed Pele. Wow. I mean, I never saw him flop in a single match. And Pele was the reason I developed luck for Coles football, for instance. And even as a young boy, Abed Pele at Newtown playing for Great Farkus, I used to follow him all over the place. And I remember his jeans. He loved wearing mm -hmm. short jeans. I followed him all over the place. Mm -hmm. And those days, you know, we had the first division. Then we had the um, second division. And then the course. And Pella was the reason I was going to the stadium at 9 a.m. to just go there and wait for Pele. I mean, I don't think I've seen anybody like that. So wow. you do not compare Pele, um, Jeboa, 
and a Samojan. He's in a different class in because again he's a midfielder. Mm. So he wasn't a striker. Mm. But even as a midfielder, he scored some incredible goals. And I remember a game in Guinea, uh, against Guinea in Kumasi, mm. uh, when he chested the ball in the last third of the pitch and controlled it the 10, 360 degrees and hit the back of the net. I couldn't control myself screaming, the maestro! Hallua! <laughs> I mean, it was incredible. Yeah. And again, don't forget that when he played for uh, Olympique Marseille, that was when they won the European Championship, mm. and they had a fearsome threesome together with Papa and Chris Waddle. These were the three top players, and to be one of the three top players for Marseille at the time, it was absolutely incredible. It was the topmost team out there. So Pele, personally, uh, with all modesty, I think is an, an entirely different class. Okay. Uh, you can compare uh, Yabua and Nasamwajan. If you have to choose one of them, Yabua and Nasamwajan, as your lead striker, <laughs> <laughs> who would you go for? <laughs> Tony Yabua, Nasamwajan, who would be your lead striker? It, it's a very tough one. Mm. Uh, it's a very tough one. Uh, the two players have different attributes. Yabua was physically very, very strong, very strong in the air, and uh, he scored some absolutely incredible goals. Um, against you remember against Wimbledon again against uh, Liverpool when he was playing for Leeds, Leeds United yeah. and I remember my first um, experience with preseason was at Leeds uh, in, that was in uh, 95 right. when I was privileged to be with the Starless and we had come at the Papa Charlton uh, International School at Manchester so I had to take treks to Leeds to observe what this all preseason training was about and I was privileged to learn a lot from Howard Wilkinson, who was the manager of Leeds United. So after training sessions, I'll go to him and mm. uh, pick some ideas. Your boy was playing. So he scored some truly incredible goals for club side, for the national side. And remember when he played for Eintracht Frankfurt, Germans hadn't seen a player like that. And developed this cult following uh, in Germany. You remember they had a team, I mean, group of supporters called the Yeboah's Witnesses, mm. as opposed to Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> Some had tattoos of Yeboah with their bodies. So, absolutely incredible. But talking about Jan, you know, the statistics weigh in his favor. Mm. Because look, this is a man who is the topmost scorer so far as national team is concerned. <laughs> Nobody has scored more goals than as a at the national level. Right. Again, on the African scene, Nobody has scored more goals than Samojan at the World Cup, mm -hmm. all right? And again, he also has scored some truly incredible goals. You remember his goal against the United States of America? Yes. You remember his goal against England um, at Wembley? That friendly. That friendly? Yeah. Against the Czech Republic? So he is also done so well that if you force me to the wall i know which you are trying to do yeah very, very because you keep you keep to trying pick, to swear pick, to pick one of them is, <laughs> going, to, is, is going to be very tough right it's going to be very tough wow interesting whoever you settle on ourselves for that <laughs> <laughs> would you struggle and uh, you know to choose between cristiano ronaldo and messi who would stand out for you as the greatest without even thinking i'll go for messi straight away uh, oh, right. Without thinking, I mean, I'm not blinking. I mean, in term, you see, Messi, like in the tennis world, like Roger Federer, Federer. And you're a he, huge he, tennis uh, fan. You're a player as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, Federer plays tennis effortlessly, as opposed to Nadal, who works towards his talent, mm. uh, as well as Djokovic. Mm. You know, Messi is God's gift to the world, and. We're blessed to have someone like that who plays football and <coughs> is such an inspiration to the sport. I mean, some of the things he's done, jaw dropping. Ronaldo, obviously, very talented, but he had to work towards his talent. So he is more of a finisher, you know, as to being a natural uh, footballer. I'm not going to think at all. I all think right. Messi, Messi is in an entirely different. Class, look, the statistics again are yeah. there. Six Ballon d'Or, and some of the things he does. He's the player who has scored more goals for a single club than anyone. I know Ronaldo also has some statistics, yeah. but in terms of natural flair and in terms of the aesthetics, in terms of the appeal, in terms of pushing you off your seat and screaming, 
I don't think I've seen anybody yeah. like my, my, uh, like 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 Messi. Two, two years ago, I interviewed Peter Drury, All right. and I asked him the same question, All and right. he says, "Messi defies physics." All right, absolutely. <laughs> and, and you know who also emphasized that? Thierry yeah. Henry was asked yeah. at Camp Nou to explain and define Messi, yeah. and said, "No, no amount of words can define Messi." Right. And he was being interviewed at the at the stadium. And he sat at the place and was pointing at a spot mm -hmm. where Messi had picked the ball and had turned 360, left his markers in his shadow. And that's why he said that move defied the laws of physics right. and gravity. And I think it's absolutely incredible. The arguments will reach. I know that, yeah. that my son uh, <laughs> is a huge fan of Ronaldo, who is oh, going to be uh, he's going very, to, very, very upset. He will be me. upset. Is he a United fan then? <laughs> my son is a United fan. Ah. And all... My family are united except supporters, you. except me, because my dad lived in Manchester, and we went there a few times. So my family, Manchester. Right. But the reason I decided not to uh, single out any team out there for support, mm. I wanted to enjoy football. Right. And uh, Kodoko had given me so much pain at the point. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to add it to It must the be pain. hard for Arsenal fans. <laughs> uh, your Arsenal fans are the best fans in the world. <laughs> and there's a reason uh, I'm told that Arsenal fans' hearts cannot be broken by any lady. <laughs> they've gone uh, through it all. They've gone through it all. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting. That's really interesting. I'll come back to the English Premier League later because I still want to stay on the Black Stars. You talked glowingly about Asam Is That's this right. why you want him to join the team in Cameroon well, next I, year? I think I made, I made that point in a okay. context. Okay. And many people to get out of context. Okay. You know, in 2010, I made a similar call for Stephen Appiah. Right. Stephen Appiah at that time hadn't kicked the ball for two years because of injury. And if you remember, the 2008 Africa Cup of Nations was injured. And I remember the opening day when the black players came out with the jersey, mm. showing so much love for him and it was all in tears. He hadn't played for two years. But the point I made at the time was that because he had saved this nation with such dedication, passion, and love, it would be important to make him part of Team Ghana. That was in 2010. Right. Only I can kick the ball. And I had no, at that time, no intention of seeing him even with a playing squad. And then the idea was bought, and I didn't know that Milo was even going to make him a part of the playing team. Right. But of course, if you go into a tournament, it's a 23-man squad. And if you're sending a 23-man squad to a tournament, the likelihood is that about six, seven of them will not even touch the ball. Mm -hmm. So it was cool, you know, and um, so it was within a similar context that I made the appeal for Asamo Jan. And I think what a lot of people missed was that there's a difference between somebody being part of Team Ghana and somebody being part of the playing squad. Right. I think that is the distinction a lot of people mm. missed. And I made the point, you remember the, the, the draw in Cameroon mm. when a number of African legends were invited yes. there, we all saw the appeal of Asamo Jan. Mm. Look, love or loathe him, this is a global icon. And he has paid his dues to this nation, so far as football is concerned. And I made the point, I remember making the point that we go to tournaments, you watch television, and you see Nigeria in their backroom staff, you see the likes of J.J. Okocha, mm -hmm. Amokachi, Mwanko Kanu, and we are applauding. <laughs> we are all applauding and encouraging them that Nigeria indeed respects their old stars who are there just encouraging the boys because most of the young boys take inspiration from these players. So it was within a similar context I made the point that if I had the power, John would be part of Team Ghana, not necessarily mm. to go and be part of the playing staff. Right. I never miss a local match. Every single weekend I'm at the stadium watching local matches, I'll pick a local match over any international game. I mean, I mean European right. football. Yeah. So yes, I was at the stadium. I've seen a somewhat John. Uh, with Legon Cities, and I do know that he's put on so much weight. Running is a problem for him right now. He had very, very little playing time for Legon Cities, right. and I'm not going to recommend that he should go and play at this stage for the Black Stars. But you think his gravitas will give the team some, some upliftment? Absolutely, right. absolutely. And my point is that, look, you had to be in Dubai during the last training session of the Black Stars. Mm -hmm. Again, if modesty would permit me, a lot of people draw conclusions based on misconceptions and their own conspiracy theories, things they don't even know about. You have to be close to the team, 
sleep with them and understand the way the team operates. You know, in Dubai, during the training session, I have personally been privileged to be part of training sessions over the years. Right. I've never seen or witnessed a more serene, tuneful, and melodious training session like what I witnessed in Dubai with Jan. Although people before that felt there was going to be that friction and acrimony between Pele, I mean, uh, Dede, Dede. Right. And, and Jan. It was far from that. So I know what love Asamojan injects in the team. And again, I remember when we went for Gabon Equatorial Guinea and uh, we were sent to Ingoni, uh, God forsaking area. It was Jan who continually inspired the team. I know what it brings to the play, the extent to which he motivates and inspires them. So I thought if you getting into a tournament and he's one of the backroom staff to inspire the boys, I thought people completely took it out of context and I was surprised at the reaction. I was really surprised. And again, I don't know whether more, no prophet is accepted in, <laughs> in his own country, yeah. but I think that we must give respect where it is due, we must give praise where it is due. The boy is paid his dues and if he's part of our team, I'd love to see people like Olili and others in the team, of course, he's playing a role as goalkeeper's mm, trainer, yeah. but there's a way these boys share the experiences with the team. You know, these old players. I tell you what, this was in 1991 when we went Kodogo. I went with Kodogo to uh, Algiers uh, to play against JSK. And we had an old player with the team who told them what problems they, they were going to confront at the airport. Because he had experienced it before, the young, most of the young boys didn't understand and appreciate the enormity of the task that confronted them. You know, and truly, when we got to the airport, I mean, we were so ill-treated, but because that player right. had prepared them, it didn't come as a shock at all. And it was with that throughout the whole period, preparing the minds of the players, motivating them, you know. So there's a way that some of these old players motivate the players. Right. And we see that in Europe. A number of times we see some of the old players uh, out there with the teams trying to encourage mm. and motivate them. So I don't think this should be taken out of context at right. all. Okay. Um, before I move on to, um, you know, things about you, your personal <laughs> life, what do you think is the problem with the Black Stars since 1982? <laughs> I mean, if you were born in 1983 <laughs> or after Ghana won the, the trophy in 1982, yeah. you've never seen Ghana That's lift a trophy. The That's Black correct. Stars lift a trophy. First what do you think all, is the problem? Yeah, first of all, you know, during uh, the great man himself, uh, or Dr. Kwame Dr. Right. I mean, I mean, he loved, he, and he had a vision, and his vision was to use football to galvanize uh, Africa, and uh, so he was very, very passionate about that. And I remember uh, C.K. Jamfi telling us that Nkrumah followed their matches all the time, and uh, even Nkrumah put you on his laps and had to pet you, the, my son. It was the biggest motivation he could get, right. you know. So he was very, very. Um, it was the inspiration behind the 63 uh, success story, 65, we won again, and then we had to wait till uh, 68. And then we won in 1978. Also because the then president of the land, Kutua Champon, loved football. Okay. And did everything. I indicated earlier how he visited Cam regularly and decided to send the entire team uh, to Brazil. And I remember when he returned, that was the first time uh, we all witnessed what we call short corner kicks. We had never seen short corner kicks in this country mm. until they returned. And I remember on the opening day of the championship when Ghana played against then Upper Volta, you know, helicopters were brought to the stadium to deliver the balls. At that time, we had never seen Adidas balls. <laughs> it was the first time we were seeing Adidas balls. <laughs> yeah, you know, so he was very, very influential right. and ensured success. After that, I do not think that uh, some of the leaders paid attention to that. Okay. I do not think so. Uh, yes, Ghana, Ghanaians love their football, but I think there was that gap, you know, so we didn't pay particular attention. And But even with that, we've come close a few times. And I thought, um, and, you know, after 78, mm. unfortunately, when we played the 1980 um, championship, 82, we won because they were remnants of the 78 squad. Okay. And at the time, to be honest, 
You remember Liman, um, President Liman, mm -hmm. was then the head of state, who had ruled that Ghana were not going to participate in the Africa Cup of Nations for political reasons. Mm -hmm. So it was, we were ruled out until uh, His Excellency Jerry John Rawlings, I mean, so rest in peace, uh, took over the reins of government and decided at the last hour that we should participate. And SK Man, who was then the uh, chairman of the Ghana Football Association, who used part of his resources to put the team together. So, to be honest, we did not believe that we were going to win the trophy, right. but these were a crop of very dedicated players. And our first two goalkeepers did not even play for whatever reasons. Uh, Baker and Carr, so Ousu Mensah had to come in. So the likes of Kwame Samson from SS74, you know, with Zion train, and others had to go win the trophy for us. 84, we went to Boaké, and I was privileged to be with the team, and we did not even exit the group stage. <laughs> 86, we didn't even qualify for the championship. 88, we didn't qualify for the championship. 1990, we didn't qualify for the championship. Until 92, when Bukasiza aided the team, we qualified for Senegal. It was one of the best squads. Unfortunately, I thought we didn't have the, come, um, the best of spirits income right. in terms of the relationship among the players. It was a very toxic environment mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of players want to shy away from that. I was with the team throughout and, you and, saw it. and I know what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't the best. Uh, so we didn't win, but it was one of the best squads this country ever assembled. We will come close to the 1978 squad, but we didn't win, you know, and then we've come close a few times, always playing in the semi-final, in the final, you know, 2013, we were that close. Uh, penalties, mm -hmm. we couldn't win, and people felt that we had been jinxed. And I remember the former president of the land, John Mahama, mm -hmm. uh, who felt, indeed, he was convinced that because the nation owed monies to some of the players, we, we had to, you don't have to go and look for money to go and pay some mm -hmm. outstanding bills uh, <laughs> of, of the players starting from 1963, all the uh, yeah. winning teams. It's still not uh, happened. But I think what people should also understand that regarding national teams, you don't have the luxury of purchasing stars. So it's cyclical at that level. And there isn't much you can do if at a certain point, there are points where you are spoiled for choice. And there are point, times that you simply do not have quality materials. Right. You know? Do we have the quality now? Um, there are some good players there, uh, but I don't want to demoralize them. Uh, okay. Football is said that it's so unpredictable. Uh, so. Even at a point that you don't expect your team to do so well, that is when they do well. Mm -hmm. I remember in 2010, not many people believed the Black Stars could even play in the final of the Africa Cup. We went all the way to the final, lost narrowly uh, to Egypt. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to write them off entirely, but for the upcoming Cup of Nations, you have all the mega teams putting an appearance. Yeah. It's going to be one of the toughest 24 team tournament. Mm -hmm with all the big stars coming at the host, Algeria defending champions, the Gala mm. out there, Egypt, Tunisia, name them, even some of the so-called smaller teams. Do we stand a chance? As I indicated, I don't want to write them off, but right. I think we should we should measure our expectations. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you don't get into a tournament and say, we're going to win it. Mm. Uh, if we win, that's fine. The, but uh, I do it, not think that yeah. you can put your hand on your chest and say, we're definitely going to yeah. win it based on the materials that we have. Uh, I do not think that uh, you need to push your luck down. Okay. So the GFA has been waging a campaign known as Bring the Love Back. Mm. At what point do you feel the love went away? Was it when we flew money to Brazil or was it that penalty miss in South Africa by Asamoah Gyan? Not at all. Which I'd... Ghanaians haven't forgotten <laughs> about. And I wonder why we still <laughs> grieve over it. It's been so long. I mean, well, cut Asamoah Gyan some slack. <laughs> well, I, I, I guess the reason a lot of people mm. uh, are still hurt mm. is the fact that we were close to the semi-final right. and would have been the first African nation to play in the semi-final of the World Cup. Yeah. And uh, we're only a kick away from the semi-final. <laughs> you know, I remember uh, I was running commentary on that match with yeah. Siki Akono, uh -huh. the manager of the side. Uh -huh. And, you know, thank God we've been trained to detach ourselves from our emotions when running commentary. So you couldn't react? I could not react, but it was the following day I shed tears <laughs> in my room. <laughs> and I remember when uh, Jan missed the, you know, so Siki Akono uh -huh. collapsed momentarily. He did. Water had to be poured on him. No way. He was standing by as, as the summarizer. And he started 
muttering some strange words that made no meaning. I don't want to repeat some of them here. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he mentioned a particular player. told me whether I knew that player was a farmer. I didn't know where that was coming from. <laughs> The man has lost it. <laughs> I didn't know it. So people, and you see, the whole Af of Africa was solely behind the Black Stars. Yeah. And I think the rest of the world, the stadium, everybody was supporting the Black Stars. Yeah. And uh, the Uruguayans were very few out there. So it's, people cannot forget about that. Yeah. Uh, but I do not think that is where we lost, a lot. lost out. Okay. I personally feel, and I'm convinced about that, mm. When some of the players decided to take this nation hostage by deciding to turn their back on us, not to attend training sessions because monies hadn't been flown, that's where they lost it. Right. Ghanaians got so upset. I was so upset. I shed tears. I was with a team of commentators and I was screaming and shedding tears. I could not believe it. Right. Because so far as I'm concerned, and I've stressed this over and over, you don't play for the national team because of money. Mm. You play out of a desire to serve your nation. You make money from your club side. You play for the national team out of love for the shit. Players in Europe and America do not play for the national team because they want to make money. They want to save their nation. They make money from the club side. But of course, there is a way the nation rewards them. Okay? So go out there, play your part, let the nation reward you, but don't hold that hostage. And I felt very, very sorry. I thought I was the only one who was that enraged and so irritated at first, so scandalized. Mm. And because you were with other nationals. Absolutely. Other, so you were embarrassed. And I was screaming right. and, and I could not believe it. Now, it's very, very easy for people to look back with the benefit of hindsight to blame the former president for flying the money. But, I mean, turn the tables. If the money hadn't been sent and the boys indeed had carried their threat to boycott the next match, I'm sure there would be a number of Ghanaians who would have blamed the president right why he didn't send that money, this small money. So uh, it's a catchy situation. Mm -hmm. But I felt that was when most Ghanaians turned their back on the national team. And I remember when the team returned to Ghana, their first engagement was against Sudan in Kumasi. And the fans, I was in Kumasi a week before the match. The fans were so angry during the match, they were booing the players. Wow. Unfortunately, the team didn't do too well. They were booed and jeered throughout the match and off the pitch. Ghanaians were so irritated because it's like, are you, mess, are you a mercenary? Are you playing for the love of the shit? Go out there, do your best, let the nation reward you. You make money at the club level. And people can argue the way they want to argue. But I do not think that people play for the national team because you, come, you have to come and hold us to ransom. So that is a major reason mm. a lot of people turn their back on the national team. The other reason was because there was this perception that officials of the FA were just siphoning monies. And again, there was this arrogance, you know, such level of haughtiness and superciliousness about the fact that we are football people. You can't talk about us. Mm. So we are so autonomous that stay in your line, let's stay in ours. And I thought many Ghanaians thought, if you want to, that is the trajectory you want to right. go, keep your football. It doesn't work like that. The nation spends so much money on the national teams, so you must be accountable. Mm. You must be transparent. You need integrity to convince the people that you are not out there just to steal monies and siphon monies from that. And again, after the World Cup, mm. when it was published and confirmed that indeed some of the officials took appearance fees, it was so scandalous. Unbelievable. Yeah. Why would an official take an appearance fee? Are you a player? <laughs> Again, why would an official yeah. attempt to take part of the winning bonus yeah. and term it on the radio? No. If officials are being paid their per diems mm. and the government in their wisdom decide that they want to pay as much as they want, I don't have a problem with that. But you are not a player. You are not entitled to winning bonus. You are not entitled to appearance fee. So when all that information got into the public domain. I think people were very, very upset. upset yeah. It's like these are people who are taking us for a ride mm. and just siphoning money because the state loved football and was pumping in money. And any time you call for accountability, you know, there was this yeah. resistance and reticence which didn't sit well with a lot of people. Mm. And I guess that is what kept away a lot of people and that is what Ket is trying very hard. How is he doing? 
in your opinion? How's I do not, Kurt doing? I, I personally, I've, I've gone on record as saying that uh, I've been, um, I mean, he's exceeded my expectation. Okay. And a lot of people have taken me on uh, for making that point. <laughs> uh, and I say this within the context that at the time he took over the governance of the FA, we were on our knees. And it was very, very difficult bringing up the sport. Don't forget that we hadn't played following um, Anas 12. Right. We hadn't played. I'll come to that in a bit. All right. We, we hadn't played football <laughs> mm -hmm. for over a year. Mm -hmm. And just as the lid was lifted for us to play football, COVID also hit. Yeah. You know? So I have been really, really impressed with the way he succeeded in successfully organizing the Premier League the FA, first and second division, women's football is now very lively. Yep. I've been extremely impressed with that. That is far from suggesting that he's without flaws. Of course, he's human. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that we should give credit where it is due. He, he's done well in that regard. Where he has to be um, careful is the perception that he tries to interfere uh, with the national team. Okay. Um, he has to be very careful uh, with that and understand that we have different roles. Everybody's got an opinion about the way the national mm -hmm. team should run, about which players should be invited. Everybody's got a, an opinion. Mm -hmm. I want to believe that if a number of journalists are invited to offer opinions about who and who should be invited, everybody has Absolutely. an opinion. But at the end of the day, the national coach has that air of finality. You can offer suggestions, but I'm saying that they, have, they remain mere suggestions. So. I guess in that arena, he's got to tread cautiously, right. not to be seen, to be dipping his hand too much into the pie. But I think generally, he's, he's not that badly. Okay. Before we take a break, um, when we come back, of course, we'll be talking about the man, <laughs> the writer, Kwabna Yabwa. Were you shocked at anything at all you saw in Anasa's expose? I wasn't shocked. I was not shocked because uh, we knew that our game was extremely corrupt. And we said it a number of times. And I remember I had issues with some officials of the FA uh, mm. for making that point. For which reason, even for some of the SWAG uh, awards, uh, invitations were resisted. Mm. I, but we knew. We knew the extent to which our referees, some of our referees, some of our referees uh, were pure criminals, mm -hmm. parading as referees, holding um, team owners to ransom. Because as soon as they were appointed, they were putting a call. We knew all that. But see, the reason we were cautious in being so categorical was that we didn't have the concrete evidence. Right. So if you made that categorical statement, a statement, for instance, the onus of proof was on you. Mm -hmm. And if you were dragged to court, for instance, uh, it was going to be very difficult proving that. So mm -hmm. we were a bit cautious. But we knew that our game was so rotting mm. and uh, there were too many criminals who had invaded our sport. So I'm not suggesting that the personalities are so necessarily mm. um, are the ones I'm talking about. But I did know that our game was very corrupt. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it, it had to take the intervention of a nurse. And again, People are people who believe that Anas has only come to destroy our sport. Because even after number 12, there are some of these activities ongoing, right. which is most unfortunate. You know, so it's as if all his work is being mm. uh, in vain. Uh, but for me, the difference between, in my opinion, what happens out there in Europe and here is that. Because it's a human institution, you always have criminal elements. Right. But over there, thorough investigations will be conducted. And if you are caught, you are punished severely. Mm. Whether it takes a year or two or three or ten years, they will definitely get at you. You remember what happened uh, in cricket, yeah. uh, in football, the case of Groble and others. So over there, like in South Africa, years ago, they swooped on some of the referees. Their houses were searched. Some of them ended up in jail. For me, it demonstrated the seriousness of getting to the bottom of, of the issue, you know. So I'm happy that uh, the current FA are desirous 
and keen on using uh, officials of the BNI and the Secret Service in tracking some of these uh, uh, activities. It is the only way we can inject some sanity in our sport because it hurts for club owners and managers to pump so much money into their teams mm. for one man to go out there and just rob them. <laughs> but yeah. having said that, I personally have been impressed with the level of officiating in our league. Right. That is not to say we, have, we don't have one or two um, misgivings. But generally speaking, I think that is improved and the speed with which referees are punished mm. for me is an encouragement. Don't think that you can go and give some dubious penalty and get away with it because there are officials waiting for you to explain things. And if, right. if it's obvious that you had it wrong, you are just struck off. And I think it's a huge deterrent uh, for would-be offenders in this particular regard. Okay. Let's take a break now. What is Olua? What <laughs> we'll, does he mean? We'll come to that. <laughs> okay. We'll come back in a bit and talk about the man himself, the man, the myth, the legend. We'll be right back. Bringing you the true definition. On Star 103.5 FM, also yeah. live on Ultimate in Kumasi and Empire in Takrad. I'm still here with the man, Kwabna Yebwa. And tonight, we are trying to get to know him, the man, the myth, the legend. So many questions uh, on social media for you. I, I don't think I can exhaust any of those because I'm not even done exhausting my questions. But what is Olua? Okay, you know, <laughs> it's an English word. Oh, is uh, it? Is it a gun word? Okay. Uh, yeah, people. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> gun. <laughs> right. Uh, H O L O A. Uh, ah. You need to get an encyclopedia together. Uh, and so, you know, I love, I love football, I love commentary. So, right. you, you are tossing matches in your mind and you are baiting and you are tossing scenarios uh, in your mind that uh, came about that. So, to describe a goal that is exciting. And, right. Uh, so, <laughs> oh my Jackson. god! Oh my god! I mean, that 
what? <laughs> That's some education. So it is not Oluwa. <laughs> Oluwa in Gambia. You're, you're so stupid. You're so, you're so <laughs> foolish. So you don't, you don't describe somebody who has scored a goal as No, <laughs> no. Okay, it all makes sense Something now. Something that is resplendent. Right, and, so uh, H-O-L-O-A. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. We learn every day. And uh, what is your connection with Harry Sawyer? Ah, uh, it's my father-in-law. Okay. Uh, oh, you're married to his daughter. Married to his, his daughter. Okay. Uh, I've known him for several years. A man who really inspired me. And you know, okay. at the time, he was the chairman of Accra Heart of Oak. Uh, mm. Around, uh, I think, 87. Okay. He was the chairman of Heart of Oak. Uh, not for a very long time, uh, for a brief period. Mm -hmm. uh, those were the days that uh, Ian Omabo, mm -hmm. Nana Rekwampe, uh, they were the patrons of the club. Right. And uh, Tommy Thompson was then the a director, head of the directorate. So they had issues and uh, Harry became the uh, chairman of the club. I've known him for some time. So <laughs> Harry, my in-law, may he so rest in peace. And uh, How was it um, <laughs> wooing his daughter, because I understand he was quite the tough man. It wasn't he, easy. I've heard so many stories <laughs> of how you finally managed to woo his daughter. I was I was very privileged. Okay. Um, I think God decided that she marry her. Okay. And interestingly, uh, she was a dad's favorite, and that she indicated uh, you couldn't invade Harry's territory with that ease. Okay. Uh, because he was a very tough guy. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't say he was tyrannical or magisterial, mm -hmm. but a very tough guy. You know, but I think he had some affection for me as well. Uh, I, and he thought, he believed. I, yes, my wife made that decision, but at the end of the day, uh, if the parents were going to be tough, it was going to be very easy, uh, difficult for you. So my mother-in-law uh, and my father-in-law uh, were quite accommodating. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I, I do not think, uh, yes, I think marriage made in heaven and I'm happy with the relationship. Oh, that's <laughs> it. How long have you been married? Uh, for 26 years. Wow. <laughs> and you have how many kids? Two, two kids. Two a boy kids. and a girl. Two boys. Two boys. Oh, you have two boys. One Manchester, one Arsenal. Nana How is that Arsenal, <laughs> Arsenal fan faring in the house? <laughs> he must be pissed. He, he is always the butt of jokes. <laughs> but he's a very, very strong Arsenal supporter who never gives up. Right. When Arsenal supporters are downhearted and they're heartbroken, he's the one encouraging them. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that Arsenal fan supporting another. And I, I've, I've warned him continually that Arsenal would never win a trophy again. If they don't change the uh, the structure of the team, when I say the structure mm -hmm. of the team, okay. you see, when Asimenga was handling the team, and a lot of people felt Asimenga was the problem. I didn't think Asimenga was the problem. Mm. You don't when Asimenga led them to win the back to back, the Invincibles. Yes. He was very fortunate at the time to have David Seaman, who was a national goalkeeper. Tony Adams was a captain in central defense. Martin Keown was there. Pires was there. Thierry Henry was there. And uh, Patrick Vieira was in central uh, uh, midfield. Will Todd was even a substitute. You remember the last game we played against Manchester? He yeah. came and scored that goal when they beat you 2 0 uh, <laughs> to win that trophy. You know, so that was an incredible squad. What happened subsequently was that they started losing their players to other teams because they were not prepared to go beyond a certain threshold. And I wrote an article years ago and said, money plays football, not coaches. Right. Football at club level is all about money. It's all about money. And it's the reason only rich teams over the years win trophies. The statistics are there. Right. Real Madrid, those days, would always buy the best players in the world. If you're the best player, they will put you. They've won the Champions League over 10 times. Yeah. Barcelona, out there. If you go to um, Germany, why do you think that Bayern Munich are always winning the trophies? Mm -hmm. It's not because they have the best coaches because they always go for the best materials. So at the time that Dortmund even won the league title, what did Bayern Munich do? Mm. They went for their top the players. Lewandowski, Lewandowski was yeah. poached, Maria Götze, mm -hmm. Götze was poached, and uh, Mats Hummels was poached to weaken the team. You know, so it's all about how much you put out there to poach players. And I think it shouldn't be too difficult to understand. So with Arsenal, I tell you what, 
they would never win any title. <laughs> they are not ready to bring. Is your son listening? To <laughs> we we have this fight all the time because they are not ready to break the bank. Look, uh, they just bought Ben White for fifty million. I mean, look at Ben White. Look, the name, <laughs> she this man. How is she going to alter their fortunes? Look, you know Paris Saint Germain. Mm -hmm. In twenty ten, we went for this uh, commentary. Um, how do you call it? Course in Paris. Mm. And our first assignment was to go and run commentary on Olympic Marseille and Paris Saint Germain. It was a team that had no shape, had no materials. That game in Paris, Marseille beat them by three goals and all. Right. And then the money backs came from Qatar and started changing the face of the team. Cavani and others were bought. Mm. They bought, you remember, they paid up 500 million for um, Neymar. Mm -hmm. And now they've gone for. So, not only did they start winning the domestic league, they started competing favorably in Europe. So they played in the quarterfinal regularly, in the semifinal. That is how to Do you build. think Messi will make any change there? Messi, whether you like it or not, is in the twilight of his career. He's, right. no, he's not a young boy. Mm. But even at his age, the, 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 the thermatology right. is still there. And uh, his presence alone, I think, would go a, a long way in helping them achieve their ultimate ambition of winning the European Championship. But it's not a done deal. I've heard a lot of people who say that PSG would definitely win the European title. Mm. I don't think it's that easy. There is nothing logical about that. Because in the European Championship, it gets the, uh, the knockout stage and just one slip, you're knocked off. So I do not think it's a done deal. But I think it's a big, big, big move uh, for Messi himself. And one million pounds sterling a week oh my goodness. doesn't come that easy. <laughs> oh my goodness! You're drilling. <laughs> I, I know, I know. I'm just wondering. I, you think United would have the same effect with Cristiano Ronaldo? Ronaldo. I mean, what is beautiful about Ronaldo is that he's one of the most hardworking athletes of our generation. So even at 36, he plays like a boy who is in his 20s. Right. He has not lost his pace. He's still got that desire and passion to play. And I think what is lacking in United is that, yeah, the midfield may not be that strong, and McTominay and Fred. Oh, gosh. Fred! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, Fred! <laughs> McTominay and Fred. Uh. The attack, Marshall did not live up to expectation. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, you have a lot of these so-called strikers United who are just blowing hot and cold. Yeah. So on a particular day, they are brilliant. Another day, mm -hmm. they're just missing obvious chances. So Ronaldo brings an, a different dimension altogether. Most of the sitters missed by a number of these players, I think Ronaldo is going to convert. Right. And uh, so I think it's a huge addition yeah. to what United have. Mm -hmm. As to whether they win the titles, another question altogether. Because I do know <laughs> that uh, Chelsea are very strong. Mm. I do know that City are always, mm. always very, very strong. Liverpool, I'm not too sure, but are strong. So it's going to be very, very tough uh, to s just conclude that United are going to win the title. But I think straight away, Chelsea and City will be my bet. Okay. And <laughs> what is it about your love for Mercedes-Benz? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, when, you, when you get into that arena... Mm. You are suggesting I'm a rich man. I'm not a rich man. <laughs> <laughs> but you are crazy about the Mercedes Benz. I, growing up, we were made to believe that it's a very good car. Right. And indeed, it's a good car. So I was fortunate to get some small money to buy a Mercedes small at money. a very <laughs> uh, tender age. Right. And I stuck to that. So, so you haven't changed it's, to it's, any brand? It's my favorite car. Right. It's my favorite car. So I've used, for example, the one I use, I've used one of my Mercedes for the last 35 years, wow. the C-Class. Oh, I, I remember that. And I, and I still love it. I'm, the one I'm still driving. Wow. Uh, I have one or two others, but I'm still in love with it. The C-Class, <laughs> the, the other one. The Why? What is it about? It? Uh, old friends are the best. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a very good one. And also, I, I mean, so you were born in Apam. That's right. But you didn't grow up in Apam. I have, I have a very checkered upbringing. <laughs> <laughs> very checkered upbringing. Uh, Multicolored, if you like. Mm. So Apam moved to Akosombo, then to Nkoko, then to Komenda, then to Odan. What? Cape Coast, Takradi then ended up at Newtown. 
So a very checkered, all because my parents didn't live in Ghana. Okay. I told him my dad left as when I was just six years to right. Manchester. Yeah. And my mom followed when I was only nine, ten years mm. to join him. So they spent all their life there and uh, we would go there occasionally. Uh, so it was more of a nomadic mm. uh, upbringing. So you move from one uncle to one auntie to one sister and then moving around. Yeah. I guess it's part of but the... But you were treated well by all of them. Life was tough, but right. it's one of the reasons I ended up in football camps. Okay. So I spent... Growing up, I spent most of my time in football camps, as I indicated, starting from Okwau's stores right. uh, to Akutex, uh, to Asante Kodoko, to the Black Stars. Mm. Spent all my time. So although I spent some time in Kumasi, I don't really know the geography very well because mm. all my time was in camp uh, right. with a team. You know, So football has just been my passion. H how many Ghanaian languages do you speak? I speak a number of languages. Okay. Uh, I speak Gan, uh, Toyota. <laughs> And Are you sure your guy is that good? I mean, the my, way you said my, Toyota. My, I don't think, my wife is a guy. <laughs> I don't think your guy is that good. I mean, you said I, Toyota. I, I understand everything you say. Right. I understand most of the things you yeah. say. And uh, I speak tree very well. Oh, you do? There are people I, who think I, you don't speak tree. I, I'm, I'm an Akan. Right. Uh, except there is a little twist to that. I told you about my checkered upbringing. Right. So I didn't stay at a particular place for too long. Right which I think affected also the language. Mm. And then I spent too much time with Harry Sawyer. Right. My wife is Ghana, and we don't speak any language apart from English. Ah. So it also affected, uh, but I, I speak Tree very well. Okay. Do you say, speak Hausa? Say, say, no, no, no. Okay. No, no. Uh, I would have lived at Newtown. Uh, I do not speak Hausa. <laughs> right. And, uh, so, and you schooled in all of these areas? It's amazing. Mm. It's amazing. It's one school to the other, to the other, to the other. <laughs> you, you must have a lot of mates. To the other, to the other. And uh, you see, that is why I'm very, very thankful to the Lord mm. for bringing me this far. Uh, considering my past and the fact that I spent all my time mm. with footballers, not many of the footballers believed I even schooled. So when I started writing, I remember also such a, one of the mm. strikers asked, ah, <laughs> 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 they didn't think they didn't think I because right. I was always at the stadium right although I was in school I would leave school and I spent all my time in camp so I remember in 78 for instance during the mm. Cup of Nations our first game was against Upper Volta mm. immediately after the game I had to jump on, on the bus to Kumasi to go and watch Morocco and Uganda and the next time next day come back to Accra uh, to watch the rest of the Black Stars game so I didn't spend too much time, you know, in school. That is why I'm very thankful to God for bringing me this far. But I, I call it divine intervention, my mm. journey into journalism. Because growing up, all I thought about was law. Mm. And uh, I had admissions at Manchester University. Mm. I don't know what happened. I just decided I wasn't going to go. And my daddy was extremely furious. He was livid with me. Yeah. And uh, I decided to do sports. So why did you pick the language and the mastery <laughs> of it from? I, I, I don't know, but I, I, I think just I read a lot. Okay. And I listen a lot. <laughs> that reminds me when we went for the commentary course uh, mm. in Paris. We had uh, one of the lectures from Australia. Mm. So after our first uh, class, so he came to me and uh, asked me where I lived in London, mm. and I told him I didn't live in London. Because you I, spoke. I, I live in. Uh, I live in Excellent Accra. English. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Right. I guess uh, he, he made a point. He was talking about the specificness of of something, and I right. told him, "You don't say specificness. You say specificity." <laughs> and he was he was asking me how long. We were just joking about that, you know. So uh, I just thank the almighty God for bringing me this far. I call it divine intervention. God mm. has been so, so merciful mm. to me. And I think he alone deserves all the thanks and praises. Absolutely. And I understand you were pretty close to G-Man. Yeah. I used to. G-Man was a brother. Okay. Uh, we spent a lot of time together. Mm. First of all, we knew ourselves when we were kids in okay. Nkoko, but we didn't spend much time. He came to Accra. Okay. And it, back in Accra, we bonded again. He was a brother. He, was, he wasn't a friend. Okay. And uh, I lived with him a few times when I lived at Letebi Okoshi. I was okay. always with him. We spent too much time together. Uh, and unfortunately, when 
that incident occurred and the, uh, he was sending some. I was there most of the time. Okay. The first few years, I was there every single Tuesday. Mm. You know, and at that time, my newspaper, the Africa Sports, was uh, appearing on the market on Mondays. And at a point, uh, I introduced the second edition, which was on Thursday, so it limited my visits. Right. So from every Tuesday, I had to move it to maybe once in one month. But he's an incredible personality, and we've been very closely associated for all this while. Okay. So <laughs> you, you were sad at the time when he was incarcerated? First of all, well, it's past. It's, yeah. un it's most unfortunate. But yeah. um, we've all learned our yeah. lessons. Uh, yeah. We've all learned our lessons. Yeah. It's not a subject I feel very comfortable uh, mm. discussing, mm. Uh, but he's learned his lessons. And uh, thank God he's found the Lord. In prison, his commitment to the Lord was absolutely incredible. Mm. You went to visit him in prison, and you were rather encouraged by him in prison. And you were wondering wow. where he was deriving that strength from. It, it was incredible. And somehow I knew that the Lord would perform a miracle. And for me, his release was miraculous. Mm -hmm. Because there are people who have been there for the last 40, 50 years mm -hmm. and are still there. And at a point, uh, one of the warden came to me and said, Jima was the best prisoner because he carried himself very well. He conducted himself very well. So at the point that the death sentence was reduced to life, he was given a special room where he was allowed to bring all his musical equipment and he started oh. teaching the inmates, you know, music. So he was an amazing prisoner, you know. And uh, I was not surprised at all that the Lord performed that miracle uh, to release him. He's now a pastor and I'm hoping uh, he stays faithful to the good Lord because he's been so good to us. You, you sound very religious. I, you know, I've been reading scripture in recent times. Mm. And, you know, you've heard about Solomon. Mm -hmm. Solomon, people talk about having 1,000 wives and concubines <laughs> and take inspiration from him. And uh, Solomon wrote Proverbs. He was a wisest king, very rich king. But after all the women and all the wisdom, you know, he wrote the Proverbs and he wrote Ecclesiastes. And if you check how he ended it all, in uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. He says, all that he has said, after all the proverbs and all the exhortations, he said, fear the Lord and worship him before the bad days. We have a responsibility, I think, uh, to um, worship God because it's a very brief life here. And we're only passing through. Mm. And as Solomon himself says in the same Ecclesiastes, he says, remember the Lord in your youthful days before the, before the bad days. I'm not saying this because I want to sound so sanctimonious, mm. uh, but because of what the Lord has done for me, and uh, Reverend, right, Reverend Anyani Bodum was the one who introduced Christ to me. Okay. So um, I owe him so much, and uh, I used to preach on buses. Uh, oh, really? From Accra to Tema on a number of times okay. at the weekends and preach from Accra to Kumasi on buses. And then preach at Circle. Now Circle, you have a lot of buildings. Those days, yeah. all bush, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, also, when I visited the Pokinti in uh, Switzerland in 1984, I used to preach in homes, mm. and uh, they had a church there where I used to preach. But there was a time that I grew cold as a Christian and did things I shouldn't have done, such as hire a jahon. <laughs> Wonderful interviewer. <laughs> you forgot we are in the same trade. <laughs> you know, yeah. but you see, it's all because as a Christian, you're supposed to be in the spirit all the time. Right. As soon as you get in the flesh, you do things of the flesh. People who don't know would think you are being hypocritical because you said A, B, C, why are you doing this? It's only because you went into the flesh. Right. And that is why you find a number of pastors and Christians doing certain things that baffles you and it gets you surprised. They are just human beings right. who just went into the flesh and did things of the flesh. And that is why scripture says God is spirit and we must worship God in truth and in spirit. As soon as you get into the flesh, you do things of the flesh. As Galatians 5 talks about, you do the things of the flesh, but you're supposed to produce the fruits um, that Christ expects yeah. us to reflect and demonstrate that Christ-like 
life in us. And it's all about love. Mm. You know, love one another. And that's why when Christ talks about, Paul talks about all the gifts, ends up saying love supersedes all. Mm. And is the greatest of all. So if you love, truly love your neighbor, you will not do some of the things that you do. So if you're a politician, you love the country, you will not be siphoning our resources. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I would recommend Christ to everybody because our lives are very, very brief. Right. Extremely brief. But as scripture says, it's appointed unto man to die once and after that judgment. Absolutely. So we have to get ready for that. Okay, three more questions. <laughs> I cannot let you go without talking about GTV. Um, you, you know, when when you your your team loses over the weekend, you just don't want to watch Kabla on Monday night because it's such a reminder of the pain. But when your team wins, you you are sitting there by seven fifteen p.m. because you know the goals will be. You've been doing this for how long? The the GTV. A sports highlight. You know, Comrade Japon, I must pay tribute to Comrade Japon, mm. uh, the former general secretary of the NPP. Mm. Uh, many people don't even know that he was one of us. Yeah. Uh, so he brought so much sprightliness and vivacity to the program mm. from 1991, 92. And then when he returned from Senegal, 92, uh, he left the scene. So my former senior, uh, Emmanuel Simpson, took over. Uh, after Colonel Japan had left. So I took over in 1994. Mm. And um, I've been doing it. The interesting thing is that when I was a young boy in mm. school, you know, Sports Allies was hosted by a gentleman called Winston Davis. Okay. It was a half cast. And I remember at the stadium, we went and hide behind him, uh, trying to appear on the screens. <laughs> and the policemen would be chasing us all over the place. <laughs> So Winston Davis was brilliant. I right. thought Kamala Japan. You know, Edward Fachi mm. hosted a program for so long. And then the state introduced what they called commentary on GTV. So mm. they needed a senior man uh, to go and read a commentary, mm. which was very, very dear to the authorities, uh, mm. led by Jerry John Rawlings. So Edward Fachi was drafted to go and read commentary. The Kamala Japan stepped in. And in those days, young people were not allowed to host programs. Mm. So Tell me about this. <laughs> <laughs> Colonel mm. Japan was one of the uh, first young people to go and host the program, and it brought so much life right. to the program. Mel Simpson took over and I took over, and uh, it was a challenge uh, matching up to that yeah. level. And uh, thank God I've enjoyed what I've done over the years, and yeah. uh, I'm still doing it. A lot of people have asked me, when are you going to quit? I said, the day Christian Mampo quits journalism, then I'll quit the program. That's a good, <laughs> that's a good answer. I like that. That's a very good answer. Um, in your spare time, you play tennis. I understand you are yeah. such a huge <laughs> tennis fan, and you play tennis as well. Yeah. You don't miss it. Monday to Friday, you play tennis? I play tennis almost every day. Uh, oh, wow. When it time will permit me. I will play at the Lisa Hotel, mm -hmm. and they will have a clay court. Mm -hmm. As you're aging, uh, clay, uh, the hard court is not too good for you. Mm -hmm. So you, you are better off playing on a clay court. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to play football, but a very bad football. I wasn't a very good footballer. <laughs> you are probably better than Fred. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but uh, I, I really, growing up, it was table tennis, which was my number one sport. Okay. Table tennis. And, oh. Uh, yeah, table tennis. And, mm. uh, you know, for uh, a decade, I was the vice chairman of the Ghana Table Tennis Association. Mm. Ebo, Swadon Lee, Ebo Battles was then uh, the chairman. Mm. And I loved table tennis so much that Although I was in a national play, I was training with the national team. So in 87, when we went for the then All-Africa Games mm. in Kenya, you know, I ended up playing for Ghana. Oh, wow. <laughs> and wow. Uh, yeah, I ended up playing for Ghana by default. Mm. Uh, the default was that we had sent over 10 players to come preparing for the uh, Cup of Nation, uh, from the All-Africa Games. Mm. And then we were told that the budget could not contain the number of players we were sent to come. So we had to cut it down. The team at that time had come to Legon. We should cut it down to eight. We cut it down to eight. They came back and told us we should still cut it down. We cut it down to six. Mm. We cut it down until we were left with only one player. Asar wow. Meya was a national champion. So we went to Kenya with only Asar Meya to go and play in the singles event. Mm. And then I went there on my own. I had bought my ticket to go and uh, report for my newspaper. Right. And then I was there one morning when uh, Udro Kwating was the leader of the team, came and told me that our chairman needed to talk to me because the Africa Tennis Federation had indicated that we had 
a seeded status. Right. That if we did not participate in the team event, we we're going to lose that seeded status. Mm. So I quickly had to, I was drafted to go and join Asaramia wow. with a coach to. And make, how did make, that go? Make, we did very well at the preliminaries. Mm. And I remember the day we played against Senegal, we had some very, very cheap opponents, and I was winning. <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, Tua Sting, who was then the secretary of youth in mm. sports, happened to be around with the contingent. Mm. And uh, he was so excited. I had bought my own ticket, so immediately after that, my ticket was refunded. Ah, bless uh, them. So, you see, talking about this tells you that we have not really developed as a sporting nation. Yeah. Because how do you send one player to go and represent the nation in table tennis and end up using a journalist and a coach <laughs> to play for the nation? And you know... Because I had gone there as a journalist and I was with our colleagues yeah. working. They were shocked to see. No, the following day, yeah. their newspaper, the new nation uh -huh. in Kenya, had me on the at the back page, journalist turned player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. And the Nigerians were all over the place, <laughs> mocking Ghana. <laughs> because Nigeria at the time, you know, it was the number one sport. Atanda Musa and Bankole and others being professional. <laughs> That's so funny. And um, who is your favorite Ghanaian musician? My favorite Ghanaian musician? Yeah. Uh, you know, we belong to the old generation. <laughs> so, uh, you know Nana Kwame Ampadu? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he's my favorite. Okay. Uh, the young ones, I don't even, I, I don't relate very well. Really? <laughs> Not really. Not even your sons play them at home? I don't listen to those ones. I'm better <laughs> off with Nanampadu. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm better off with, uh, mm -hmm. the closest I've come is Kojo Entry, the maestro. Okay. I think he's an extraordinary talent. Between Kojo Entry and Daddy Lumba, who would you go for? Kojo Entry. Okay. Kojo Entry will always be my man. Okay. I mean, he's, he's, he's an amazing musician okay. who has lived the years. Yeah. And another thing I love about Kojentri is his character. Right. Do you realize that he has survived all these years without needless controversies? Mm -hmm. He hardly gets into controversies. Yeah. He's carried himself very, very well. Yeah. Doesn't get into politics, into any friction. Yeah. He's mining his music business. Yeah. And I think he's, a, he's, he's, he's an example worthy of emulation. Right. It's <laughs> such a pleasure talking to you. I have so many questions, but I've exhausted my time, and I have to let you go. God will do it again. <laughs> I definitely. But it's been such an honor talking to you this evening. You are you're a legend. You are a legend. And I have so much, so much respect and reverence for you. Thank I'm, you so much for talking to me. It's mutual. <laughs> thank you so much for the privilege. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening to the show and for watching us on Facebook as well. Have a good night. I think we'll leave you with uh, something from...